So the idea of this topic is we, as you can see, dynamic. Dynamic means like something is moving, right? I'm trying to see the effect of one variable on the other variable over time, okay? So it's something like this. I want to analyze how y is a function of, and this is y t, so t is today. And let's see, let's say, let's say today is 20, let's say 20, assuming that we do have the date, okay? So I want to see whether y t is affected by x today, x last year, x two years ago, and then we keep going, x t minus a certain number, let's say q, okay? This is q, not 9. So the idea of this topic is to analyze the effect of today and the history of x on y. I might also add to this, not only the lags, we call these lags, lags are past values, okay? I can also expand this analysis by adding future values of x, so x t plus one, x t plus two, and then x t plus a certain number k, okay? So, and then I can add these other additional variables right here, okay, or anywhere in this function. So I'm not only analyzing the past, but I'm analyzing the past, the present, so these are the past, the present, and the future values of x on y. Okay, uh, this is very, very important in time series analysis. Let's say I want to see how um, Canada exports or the Canadian exports are affected by the economic conditions in the US. In other words, let's take GDP in the US and see how today's GDP is affecting the Canadian exports. How the past values of the US GDP are affecting the Canadian exports. How the future values of the US GDP are affecting the Canadian exports. And I might find statistical significant effects and I might find insignificant effects. These are all open to the analysis. So when we come to the title of the topic, when we say dynamic, dynamic is all about the movement of the variable over time. Okay, it's not static analysis, it's a dynamic. What we have done before was basically a static analysis because most of our applications were a certain point in time right we were analyzing let's say the effect of a class size how many students in class on the test score and this was in a specific point in time now we are doing this analysis in a dynamic way a non-static way a movement over time and how this affects a certain point in time of the dependent variable so Causal, you know already that the word, uh, you know already that the word causal effect is X affects Y. X causes Y, right? So it's X causes Y. So causation is coming from the word causes, causation effect or causal effect. And our analysis that we are going to um, apply for this topic is the orange juice data. What is the orange juice data? It's uh, trying to see how the price, the price of orange, I'm gonna write it as OG, uh, orange juice. The price of orange juice is a function of weather, okay? So weather, uh, we know that weather affects the agriculture sector in general, it affects the production of oranges and thereby it's going to also affect the prices of oranges. So in other words, if I have bad weather, then a bad weather means lower orange production or supply 
and if I have low supply, you know this, your, you guys are economics major. So the lower the supply, the lower the price. So price of orange juice would also fall. Okay, so the lower the supply, the lower the price, holding everything else constant. So here, our analysis for this topic would be how bad weather affects the price of orange juice. And by bad weather, we, uh, we need to have like a definition of what is a bad weather because I can say like it's very relative, right? A bad weather is relative for me versus another person. Uh, so it also goes in this analysis. So a bad weather is measured by the number of freezing degree days. So we're gonna count each month how many days are freezing because freezing degree days, like freezing days implies low production, okay? So we're gonna count how many um, freezing degree days are in the month. And we have to have a certain benchmark. What do you mean by a freezing? Is freezing is 30 Fahrenheit or freezing is 15 Fahrenheit and below? 30 and below, 15 and below, 20 and below. So we need to have a certain definition right uh, in order to start this analysis or in order to start counting how many freezing degree days so this is just the outline so we're saying that we're going to analyze uh, the impact of weather on the orange juice uh, data we're going to talk about a new type of model which is called the distributed lag model lag is the past values um, given that we are going to talk about time series analysis, then I should expect that today's price of orange juice is correlated with yesterday's price of orange juice. And today is gonna have an effect on tomorrow. So we have some type of autocorrelation between price of orange juice today and yesterday and day before and tomorrow and day after tomorrow and so on. Uh, and we have to include that in our analysis because it's no more a static standard error. It's a standard error that is moving, right, with time. Uh, our applications, as I said, is orange juice prices, and then we're gonna talk about what do we mean by exogenite. We have already introduced this term uh, when we were talking about uh, instrumental variable regression, right? So we're gonna talk more about. It. Okay, so a dynamic causal effect. It's the effect on Y of a change in X over time. And this over time implies back in like the past history or in the future, okay? These are just some examples. So what is the effect of an, an, an increase in cigarette taxes on cigarette consumption this year, next year, in five years? We're moving over time. What's the effect of a change in federal funds rate on inflation? This month, in six months, in a year. So you keep moving over time. The effect is not just a one-time effect. It's an effect that moves changes over time. It might be important this month, but not important in six months, not important in a year. Or it might be not important this month, but important in six months and beyond, okay? Um, and then uh, the last example is our application for today, which is the effect of uh, a freeze in Florida on the price of orange juice in months, in two months, in three months. We keep going. Actually, the analysis goes up to 18 months, okay? And you have the example in your textbook. Okay, so in the orange juice data, we have um, data, uh, and this is based on a certain uh, uh, research paper, uh, and this is uh, on orange juice prices, starting from Jan 1950 all the way to December 2000, and this is the price of orange, uh, orange juice, and we're using it in percentage form annualized, so I multiply each month by, I mean like each year I have 12 months, 
So if I want to annualize this data, which is court, which is monthly, okay, this is a monthly data. I want to annualize it, so each year has 12 months, so I have to multiply times 12. And then if I want the changes in percent, then I have to have 12 times 100 in order to get in percentage. And this is to get the annual rate. And this is optional, by the way, like you, you can have a monthly analysis, but sometimes you want to provide policy implications to uh, policymakers working, let's say, in the US, uh, in the BLS, which is the US uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics. You want to provide for them some policy analysis. So those people are more concerned about um, what is the overall picture, right? So they want to have a picture on the whole year. So you can provide an analysis monthly or annual. And if you have monthly data as we have it right here, then you can always annualize it by multiplying times 12. And if you want to have uh, uh, a percentage format, then you just multiply times 100. Okay, so these are the number of freezing degree days. And then this is an example. If November has two days, with lows less than 32 degrees Fahrenheit. One is 30 and the other one is 25. Then the freezing degree days are two and seven, which means you're taking 32 minus 30. It's giving me two degrees be below the threshold, two degrees be be below the 32, and uh, which is right here. And then 32 minus 25, this is giving me seven. So the number of freezing degree days or FDD in November is two plus seven, right? Uh, which is how many, how many degrees below the threshold. So one time I had only two, which is relatively better than having seven degrees below my threshold. So this analysis is done using 32 degrees Fahrenheit as our freezing degree. Okay, this is just a graphical representation. Uh, you know that the price index is, you can use the consumer price index, the CPI. You can use the deflator, the price def deflator. You guys are economics majors, so I'm kind of confident that you know what I mean. So an index is just an index that goes from zero to 100 and or maybe beyond, as you can see it here, because sometimes I do have, um, this is our base year, okay, 100. And then sometimes I do have a certain uh, price which is above the base year. So this is an index, but we are more interested in checking the percentage change in the index. We're not concerned about the index as much as the percentage change in the price. So this is the percentage change in the price of orange juice. And these are the freezing degree days, okay? so. Uh, this is by year from 1950 to uh, 2000, okay? So let's say this is a monthly freezing degree days. So let's say here it was like, maybe this is four, right? The first one. So maybe this is like four or something. So this one is telling me that in this specific year, I'm not sure about the month because we don't have um, the x-axis about the year. So let's say 1950, we had about four freezing degree uh, days, right? And then let's say another example in 2000, uh, sorry, this is 1990, I can see, maybe around 20 freezing degree days, right? This is the worst, right? And this is probably the best, okay? So um, this is just a graphic representation of what we see. So what we're gonna do is, we are gonna do like an all S regression, okay? Uh, I'm sorry about this question mark. This question mark is when I, uh, ex when I imported the PDF file into my iPad, I see like some sign changes. So this is simply the percentage, okay? So just this is the percentage. Uh, everywhere we have a percentage symbol, it comes with a question mark. So don't worry about it. This is just a percentage. Uh, you can easily open the, the slides on your computer. You have it on Sakai. And hopefully when you open it, you don't see the, percent, the, the question mark. Anyways, this one is an OLS 
estimation, we, like nothing is new. Uh, this one is telling me that the increase in freezing degree days, right, by one unit, which is simply a unit here is a day, by one day increases the price by 0.47%, okay? Um, so it's positive, statistically significant. You just divide this by this, you will get the T statistic as uh, statistically uh, significant. And the main conclusion is more freezing degree days price would increase. How about the standard error? Is this the normal standard error that we used to use? Like we used to use like the regular OLS standard error, but now we have some type of autocorrelation, right? Um, I would expect that, let me uh, explain that. So this is the percentage change in price. It's equal to beta naught plus beta one freezing degree days plus U. And everything is moving over time. So I need to have a sub T here, right? And what we have in this slide is this impact, this on this, but I do have other factors right here, right? Um, that would also affect the price, okay? And these factors are correlated over time. So the correlation between UT and UT minus one might not be equal to zero, might be equal to a certain number. We don't care whether this is positive or negative, but it's non-zero. So if I do have some type of serial correlation, what is a serial correlation is simply a, 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 a correlation for the error term. It's just a correlation. Anytime we have a correlation for the error term, we just name it serial correlation. So if I have a serial correlation in the model, which we never had before in any previous topic, because this is our first time to introduce a time in the model at or uh, uh, a time series. So anytime I do have a correlation between the errors, I cannot keep on using the normal standard errors. I have to adjust that. And our new um, standard error for this topic is called the heteroscedastic autocorrelation consistent standard error. And it is known for the hack estimator. HAC, hack estimator or hack standard error. And you already know heteroscedasticity, right? Nothing is new. You know about heteroscedasticity. So if I have a group of people um, moving uh, or I can classify them by income, so I have a low income group, middle income group, high income group, I can never say that these people are homogenous, right? They are heterogeneous in their behavior, um, in how they save their income, in how they consume, in how they choose what to consume and so on. So heterogeneity is already something that we have discussed. We already know how to uh, check it. Uh, we already know how to correct the model if I have heteroscedasticity. We said that if any time I have heteroscedasticity, then use a robust standard error to correct for robust, this is a U, robust uh, standard error to correct for uh, heterogeneity in your sample. But we never talked about autocorrelation. So now we're gonna introduce something new, uh, which is the hack estimator, the hack standard error that allows for two in one. What is two in one? It allows for heterogeneity, which we would expect. It would allow also for serial correlation, which we will need to test. Okay. Uh, okay, so this is just something repeated, so let me move on. Okay, so by the end, we want to measure the variation in our dependent variable, which is the percentage change in the price because of the variation in freezing degree days. When I say variation, you already saw the graph. We have variations, right? Sometimes we have high numbers, sometimes we have low numbers, and sometimes we have in between, so on. So I want to see how uh, 
these movements in FDD affect the percentage change in price. Okay. Um, let me skip this word for now. I'm going to come to this word, which is about stationarity when we start time series. So let's just skip this paragraph. But the most important part is our analysis for this topic is called the distributed lag model or the distributed lag estimator. And this is what we are going to estimate. So here we're going to have more details. Um, what if I want to estimate y as a function of today's value of x, yesterday, two days ago, three days ago, and then r days ago? How does uh, how today and past values of x affect y? This is called a distributed lag model. Okay, ADL. So remember, this is abbreviated as um, not ADL, DL for now distributed lag because we're going to add the augmented part so once i add augmented i'm going to call it adl but for now it's just like distributed lag okay so when you look at uh, the coefficients attached to the x each one has a certain name the beta which is attached to the present value of x is called the impact effect of x of the change in x the beta 2 is called the first period dynamic multiplier. The beta, which is beta 3, which I don't see it here, but let's say this is beta 3, x t minus 2. The beta 3 is the two period dynamic multiplier, which would give you the effect of a change in x t minus 2, holding constant the present, the previous uh, lag, x t minus 1, x t minus three and then keep going up to xt minus r okay so looking at this model um i can i'm sorry looking at this model i just want to erase and when i look at this model i can uh, analyze it as follows so i can say okay this is the impact of today's value of x holding the history constant this is the impact of last year or last month or yesterday, depending on the data frequency I have. Um, this is the impact of x t minus one on y t holding x t constant and everything else constant, right? So anytime I'm analyzing the impact of one of the components, I'm holding everything else constant. Okay, uh, we call this impact. We call this first period dynamic multiplier, second period dynamic multiplier, right? And then this is R period dynamic multiplier. Uh, this slide is very important, okay? Um, from the IV, I want you to remember this. I want you to recall this from the IV regression model or IV regression topic. We were talking about exogeneity. What is exogeneity? So I want X to be exogenous to the error term. I want the connection between X and U to be equal to zero. In other words, I want the correlation, I want the covariance between X and U to be equal to zero. They are not connected or correlated at all. So in this topic, because we are talking about past values and future values, then we have to in introduce lags. In the IV model, we stopped up to here, okay? And our bracket was closing here. So ut given xt is equal to zero. But now, since I'm introducing the lags and the leads, which is the future values, okay? So uh, we call exogenous, sorry, we call, uh, we call the condition as being exogenous if the xt and its lags are not correlated with uh, error term. Also, to be more strict, like to have a more strict condition, add the future values. Future values, we call them leads. So the lags and the leads and the present value 
of x are not at all correlated with the error zone, with the error zone. And, I, and I'm sure that you understand that this is like um, a very challenging condition, right? Because you want to say that, like based on this first one, you basically want to say that there is no connection between other factors affecting the price of orange and the weather. Okay, do you understand that? Let me write it in terms of our freezing degree days and example. So this condition is like, the expectation, I'm gonna call it U or I can call it other factors affecting the price. Okay, so other factors affecting the price of orange juice and freezing degree days today, freezing degree days yesterday, keep going, freezing degree days T minus Q. They, has to, they have to be equal to zero, the, or this condition has to be equal to zero. Can someone tell me what are other factors affecting the price of orange juice besides the weather? How about uh, Lewis? Can you think about other factors affecting the price of orange? The weather. An orange besides the weather you said? Yes, so now we're saying that weather affects the price of orange. Do you think of other factors affecting the price of orange? You know, it's actually a good question. I'm really trying to think about what really affects an orange besides its weather. I'd, I'd the price the of orange juice, I should say. Orange juice. Oh, orange, orange juice, when you juice. go to the grocery store and buying orange juice, is the price of orange juice is only affected by the weather or do you think about other factors? Uh, taxes or something? I'm not really sure. Maybe taxes. Mm. What else? Osman, can you think about something? Yeah, I mean, if you go in depth with it, um, like, orange like juice has vitamins. Vitamin. Sorry, oh, I can... can... Uh, like a shortage, shortage of oranges? Lewis, what you're saying? Like shortages, like not having enough oranges? Which is the like supply? Which is the yeah, supply. So it, yeah, making it more expensive, I guess. Exactly. So this is a good point. So the supply and the supply is actually connected with the freezing degree days, which is the, which is the. So the supply is affected by the weather again, right? Yeah. Okay. What else? Yeah. Uh, I was gonna say like the demand, because orange juice has vitamin C. So of course, like during flu season, people would want to increase their immune support. So the exactly. For orange. That's perfect. Yes, exactly. So the demand, I want to think about this as the price conditioned on weather. And you guys said, okay, there are other factors affecting the price. And yes, taxes are affecting the price. Definitely the higher the taxes, the higher the price. The supply, the higher the supply, the higher the price. And Osman mentioned uh, demand, which is great. Demand is also because when I go to the grocery store, whatever the weather is, I might have, as you said, like during the virus, everyone wants to have more um, vitamin C. So here is the demand of the consumer, regardless of the weather, we want to consume more vitamin C. So this is actually great because when you think about it this way, um, the price of orange juice is equal to beta naught plus beta one freezing degree days plus the error term. If this error term has, let's pick one of the factors you guys mentioned, let's say the demand. So if the demand is right here, then the demand is also affected by the weather, right? So if I have hurricane outside, I might not go to the, to, to, to the grocery store to get uh, the orange juice. 
holding constant the online shopping okay so we know i can sit in my house and then order online from amazon or something but let's say holding constant online shopping so i can still see there is a connection between other factors and freezing degree days so when i come to this condition demand is here conditioned on the freezing degree days yes they cannot be equal to zero right so the demand for orange juice might be affected by the freezing degree days so this condition might not be exogenous right you can also think about it that is my demand which is instead of the you think about uh, your demand is included in the error term because it's not included in this regression model so my demand is included inside the other factors which are inside the you so my demand conditioned on today's weather tomorrow's weather right the past history of the weather has to be equal to zero and again, this might be a challenging condition because if I know that it's going to have rain tomorrow or we're going to have snow tomorrow, I might go right now to the grocery store and get my stuff, right? So demand to be totally disconnected with the weather is not an easy assumption to achieve. So each and every time we're trying to think about exogeneity and strict exogeneity condition, it might not be that easy. So let's say, I'm gonna give you another example, which is actually from your practice. So in your practice, we have, um, we have, what we have, we have Australian exports. Equal to beta naught plus beta one us gdp plus ut everything is moving over time in order to achieve the exogeneity assumption the exogeneity assumption is saying that i need the expectation of the error term given today's value of xt past values of xt to be totally disconnected, right? Equal to zero with the error term. So I can rewrite this condition based on our example. The expectation of UT given, right? US GDP today, US GDP yesterday or last year or last month, again, depending on our data frequency, US GDP, maybe 10 years ago, T minus 10. I want this to be equal to zero. So again, to rewrite this, to make it easier, think about this one as other factors. Other factors affecting US exports. So other factors, can you try to think about other factors that are totally disconnected other factors affecting uh, Australian exports that are totally disconnected from the US GDP. So these are other um, factors affecting my Y or the dependent variable. Australian exports. Okay. So at many times you can easily get, or not at many times, uh, sometimes you can easily get this condition satisfied and at many times you might not okay so let's say can i can i think of something that creates a link between these two and it goes this way if i do then this condition is not satisfied okay so you want all the time to make sure that i have exogeneity condition condition or you can also add the future us gdp t plus one and then us gdp maybe 10 years okay more so in the future you go in the future 10 years okay 
and we call this one as strictly exogenous. Okay, so if you think about, let's say, the US, uh, I mean, the, the Australian imports, okay, the Australian imports from the US. Do you think the Australian imports, because the Australian imports are is not here in this regression, they might be other factors, right, in the U. So if you think about the Australian uh, imports, the Australian imports, do you think the Australian imports from us, from the US, um, affects our GDP, right? Australian imports affect our GDP. If yes, then I cannot say that this condition is satisfied. It's not. There is a connection, okay? Um, and, how, and, and why I thought about Australian imports, because the Australian exports affects the Australian economy, and one of the variables in the Australian economy is Australian imports, right? And if Australian imports from the U.S. Um, are affecting the U.S. GDP, then we have this way causation too. And in this way, I'm going to say U.S. GDP is endogenous. And accordingly, I cannot satisfy this assumption. So if you think about here, Australian imports, imports from the U.S., okay, specifically from the U.S. Another argument you can say that, okay, uh, actually Australian imports from the U.S. are tiny, right, are small as compared to our huge GDP, the size of the U.S. GDP. So the variation in the Australian imports from the U.S. GDP um, are not considered very, a huge variation in our income in the US. Accordingly, this link might be there, but insignificant. You guys get what I mean? Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, Othman and Louis, do you have any question? Uh, no, not right now, I'm just trying to follow along, so. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the idea is each, like the most challenging part of this, uh, topic is trying to think deeply about the model, okay? And in order to think deeply about the model, in order to be able to say, okay, they are exogenous. So if I'm trying, if I'm able to make the argument that one of the factors affecting Australian exports are the Australian imports, uh, I should say it another way. One of the factors affected by Australian exports is the Australian imports. And if, if Australian imports from the US are insignificant, affecting the US GDP, then this condition is satisfied. And the future of the, um, our GDP is not also affected by the Australian imports from us. So if you can make this argument, then you're good to go to start estimating the model by the distributed lag. Okay, the distributed lag model. If I add to this model the past and the future, we call it the augmented distributed lag model, ADL. ADL includes the past and the future. Okay, so uh, again, one of the challenging questions in this topic is trying to make an argument of this connection between other factors and your X in the model, okay? The variable that you have in the model as X, okay? All right, so let's go uh, continue. So this is the distributed lag model. It's easy, X and it's past. It, it follows certain assumptions as every time we introduce a model or uh, uh, an estimation methodology, we need to have certain assumptions satisfied. So the assumptions of this uh, model is that uh, we already discussed that, that X is exogenous. Um, again, I'm gonna come to what do you mean by stationarity next week. So let's keep this, skip this for now. Uh, another important assumption, I'm sorry, the numbering of the assumptions are off. Again, when I was importing the PDF file, so you have a numbering here. This is another assumption and there is another assumption and this is an assumption. This is another assumption. Okay. So 
the combination of XTN YT, so freezing degree days today and the price of orange today are totally disconnected or independent from freezing degree days 10 years ago and the price of oranges 10 years ago. So each and every combination of X and Y are totally independent. We don't have any outliers, outliers in the model, okay? As we usually make this assumption and we also make always the assumption of no perfect multicollinearity in the model. Okay, so this is just a discussion of the assumptions. You can read them. Um, again, this one is telling us that each and every combination of X and Y totally independent, right? It's like here, this is X and this is Y, but not, now my X is 1990, 1991, 1992, and so on, right? Each and every combination, each and every dot, which has an X and a Y are totally independent. This is what the assumption is talking about. Okay, so we, yes, we call it a distributed lag model, but by the end, it's actually estimated by OLS. Um, it's, yes, it's, it's estimated, like, like the main difference between the topic of uh, today and any other topic that we have discussed before is the standard error that we have to adjust. Yes, we are still using the same methodology, which is the OLS or the mean least squares. And this would give us the consistent estimators of beta one, beta two, beta three, and so on. Um, the main difference is I have to adjust my standard error to allow for this dynamic effect, to allow for this serial correlation uh, that might be present in the model, okay? So that's why we have to account for a possible autocorrelation, and more specifically, we call it serial correlation, if I'm talking about autocorrelation between the error terms, and heteroscedastic. And that's why it's called the heteroscedastic autocorrelation consistent, because we will get a consistent estimators. All right, so we abbreviate it as Heteroscedastic, the autocorrelation consistent standard error, right? The hack estimator. So, um, how can we do that? I, and and I'm, uh, I want to warn you that starting from this slide and the next probably 10 slides, we have um, so many formulas and uh, you have to understand them. You don't have, of course, to memorize anything, you just have to understand them and how we move from one to the next. So to make the life simple, this uh, uh, derivation is uh, made for just one regressor X, okay? So we just have one regressor XT, okay? And then um, as you already know that if I have more than one X, then I would have to use the matrix operation. So to make our life easy, we just, we're just talking about just one X in the model. So here what we have is we're going back to our chapter four, right? When we were deriving, uh, deri deriving the OLS estimator. And we said that this is the estimated coefficient. This is the population um, coefficient. And we said that if these are equal, then I have unbiased consistent estimators. If you can't remember how we derived this uh, formula, you can go to appendix 4.3 and check the derivation of the formula. But anyways, uh, we said all the time that in like an easy way of writing this, we said that beta hat is equal to the covariance between y and x over the variance of x. Right, and then when you open this up, right, and when you open this up, and you can always replace the y with the u, then you would be able to get this condition. And I want you to, before moving from this slide, if you really can't remember, to go back to uh, Appendix 4.3 and make sure that you're not turning the slide before understanding how we got 
this formula. It's uh, straightforward if you read the 4.3, and I did um, explain it uh, during the first week or the second week of our course. Um, in any case, uh, this is something we already know, which is based on the idea that the coefficient of OLS is equal to the covariance over the variance. This is the variance of X and this is the covariance between X and UT, where UT is replacing YT and YT uh, and why we, we, we replaced it, uh, it's written in the appendix in details. So in any case, we really don't care about the denominator, right? Which is the variance of X. It doesn't have any connection with the error term, which is our main um, issue, which is the serial correlation. The serial correlation only appears in the upper part, which is VT, where VT is simply written for um, this numerator part. Okay, so if I do have serial correlation, then it would actually appear in the upper part of this formula, not in the lower part. And that's why um, from now on, we're kind of focusing on the upper part. The lower part is the same everywhere, right? It's the same everywhere. So just focus on the upper part of this uh, formula because this is what re really matters for the definition of a serial or autocorrelation. So in large samples, we want to compute the variance of beta one. We're saying large variance, a large sample, because I want to talk about consistency. Consistency is related to large samples, okay? Uh, consistency means that the difference between beta hat minus the beta from the population, let's say this is beta hat one and this is beta one, this is from the population and this is from the sample. If I'm not talking about large sample, then I'm basically saying that this is about unbiased, unbiased. Oh my God, this is. Okay, so this refers to unbiased, okay? But if I'm talking about large sample, then I'm talking about consistent. So consistent is like the, uh, a larger uh, picture that includes unbiased. So if I'm saying that a coefficient is consistent means that in large sample, if you maximize the sample, you would be able to get this variable close to, um, not the it's not a variable, this coefficient is close to this coefficient with high probability. Again, refer to the first week or the second week for a definition of consistency. So let's focus on the upper part. So the upper part is talking about the variance, right? We're taking this upper part from the previous slide, um, which is this one, and we're adding the variance operator. So we're taking this variance and then taking the one over T outside the variance operator. It comes with one T square, one over T square, and then the variance of this sum. I have to sum T1, right? That starts from, let's say, 2000, and this starts from 2001. Okay, yeah, because I wanna see how each year is correlated with another year. Okay, so one of the index or sub-index start from one, T1, and the other one is S1. T could be the starting point, which is let's say 1980, and S could be 1981, okay? But the idea is I'm taking each and every year uh, in order to see whether there is a serial correlation or not. So you're computing this for different years, right? And in our, all our previous topics, we were assuming that we had IID, okay? Independently, identically distributed cross-sectional data. So in our previous analysis, since the start of this semester, we were all the time assuming there is no connection between each and every observation. So our life was actually easy because we were assuming that covariance is equal to zero. So any term that has a covariance, then I, uh, I have it as equal to zero. So we never had T and S, we only had T, right? Or we never had I and N, we only had I, one single person at a time. So I, I, would I was never like trying to estimate the connection between person one and person two. Right? We were saying that each person is totally independent. So 
if I still have this condition satisfied, then T is not equal to S, right? So I'm going back to my OLS formula, which is the variance over, right, the T over sigma square. So I'm going back to my usual cross-sectional result for the variance of OLS. And again, if this is something that you cannot remember, go to appendix 4.3. So the main uh, difference here is whether I do have a covariance between the years being equal to zero or whether this covariance is not equal to zero. If it is equal to zero, as we had assumed all the time, then I'm going back to my usual um, result. If it is not, then I have to keep going. So if this covariance is not equal to zero, let's assume I have only two years, okay? So 1980 and 1981. And the covariance between both years is not equal to zero. There is certain number. So if this is the case, then I have to compute it. I have to take it into my account that freezing degree days of 1980 are also correlated with freezing degree days of 1981. Okay, um, or 1981 is correlated with its past 1980. So I do have some type of correlation. So if this is the case, then I do have to compute this variance. And I have to open it up into the variance of the first year, the variance of the second year, plus two covariance year one, year two. Right? Remember what is the V? The V is not only about the year, it's about the observations of. Um, of x and u, right? V is about x and u. Remember, this is the bar, which means the mean of x, which is going to be the same in each and every year. This is the average of the freezing degree days in your sample. If you don't understand, if you're lost, just stop me. Okay, what else? So a variance has a sigma square notation. Okay, so I have a variance here, sigma square, and I have another one here, then it's a two sigma square. Two sigma square divided by uh, four, then it's gonna be like half sigma square. Then I have another quarter that is multiplied times the two, then I'm left with one over two, and then rho, this is a row notation, this is a covariance of uh, or, or uh, sorry, this is the correlation, right? This is the correlation uh, notation. We were able to replace this covariance because we know that a correlation is equal to the covariance over the variance, right? So I can remove this covariance and add these two, which was done right here. Now I can combine. So I can take a common factor, right? Which is the sigma square, sigma square, and we have a new term which is called F. And two here stands for the two years. You can keep changing this F2, F3, F4, whatever, on, based on how many years you're trying to compute the covariance. Okay, so, so this one, we're, we ending up, we're ending uh, here by trying to write this in, in a nice way, but saying, okay, it's half, one plus rho one sigma square. And then we decided to remove this one and say, let's call it F. And since I only have two years, then I'm gonna have a certain notation two. If I have three, then F3, if FT capital T, then it's uh, F capital T and so on. So now, as you can see, the variance is not given by the usual formula because it's off by a certain factor, right? Which is F2 in this case. So let's go back and add this F to our uh, notation. As I told you, just keep the denominator the same everywhere because we really don't care about the denominator. It's always gonna be the same. It doesn't have any serial correlation. It's not uh, part of your uh, error term is not correlated with the error term. Our focus was basically related to the upper part and we ended up by saying that the variance of this is equal to sigma square over T, FT. So we can plug it in back here and say that 
um, this OLS standard are, are off by a factor FT. Just notice that again, when I was importing, importing my PDF file, the T is not, it's supposed to be like this, sub T, right? Not multiply, okay? So um, same goes here. It's U sub T, not U multiplied times T. So if at any time I do have a serial correlation, today's weather is correlated with yesterday's weather, then I do have to adjust to account for this correlation. And in order to do that, we have to add a certain factor FT that accounts for the correlation. And as you can see, this correlation, T here, capital T, is the very, very last year I have, okay? So let's say today is 1980, and my analysis is going back to the past to 1970, then I have T, it's gonna be like my capital T is 10 years, okay? So I have to keep a, a going over the 10 years, counting or adding up, not counting, okay, adding up, as you can see the summation here, summation sign, adding up correlation of each and every year so that I can adjust the variance of the beta, okay? So that means I need to have a totally different standard error formula. The standard error formula is accounting for the factor F sub T, right? This is F sub T. And the F sub T depends on the addition of all the correlations between T and T minus one, T minus two and T, T and T minus three, T and T minus four, T and T minus K and keep going all the years, even if it is, let's say 10 years ago, then T T minus 10. So <clears throat> as I said, this, standard error or this adjusted standard error is consistent and heteroscedastic accounts for autocorrelation and would give us a consistent estimator. So that's why it's called the heteroscedastic autocorrelation standard error. Sometimes you will see, not in our textbook, in our textbook they call it hack estimator, but in some other cases it is called HAR, which is heteroscedastic autocorrelation robust so it doesn't matter, it's the same. Okay, now let's uh, go into to some details. As I mentioned that T here stand for, stands for the very, very last year. So if I have from 1980 and I'm going all the way to the past to 1970, so I have T equal to 10, I might not be interested in the 10 years, right? I really might not be interested in the 10 years. I might be interested in the correlation between freezing degree days and only the last two years, okay? So you can adjust this T by using M. So M is not equal to T. T is everything, like the whole data set. I might only be interested in three years in the past, okay? So in order to do that, we need to like truncate this data set, cut this data set, shorten this data set. And that's why this M is called the truncation parameter, which means that when do you want to stop your autocorrelation to be computed? If you don't specify this truncation parameter, then that's fine, but you might be going all the way in the past that the autocorrelation might be really insignificant and might not um, show the importance of serial correlation in your data set. So you might say, okay, stop only up to the last three years and compute my serial correlation up to the last three years only or truncate my data set up to three years. And that's why, again, it's called truncation plan. Uh, to determine how many years I wanna stop at, there are two ways. One way is called the Goldilocks method. Goldilocks method is there is no rule, just not too many and not too few, okay? So there is no threshold, there is no computation about when to stop. Um, I don't like to use the Goldilocks method because it's more of uh, subjective about too many and too few, 
um, and also it depends on the data frequency. So if I have a, a monthly data versus yearly data versus weekly data versus daily data, not too few and not too many might be subjective. I prefer to use a computation, which is the rule of thumb. The rule of thumb here is basically telling us get 75% of your total T, right? If I have T equal to 10, get 75% of that, but then raise it to power third, okay? So this is the way that we are going to use it, okay? I don't want to leave, to leave it for you to decide what do we mean by uh, uh, not too many and not too few, right? I want it to be based on a certain computation or a rule of thumb, okay? So, um, so let's continue, so let's see. This is uh, something similar to what we are going to do today, okay? Remember, our objective is to uh, estimate this function, the percentage change in the price of orange juice depends on beta naught plus beta one, freezing degree days. And this is exactly what this um, regression is doing. Okay, so regress, D stands for the change. Okay, so this is, uh, you, you don't see it here, but I want you to imagine like um, you have a price of orange juice as like a variable. So you want to create LPOJ, which is the log of POJ. And then you want to create another variable, which is called the change. So D L P O J is equal to D dot L price of orange. Okay, so these are two commands that are missing from the slide. You probably can add them uh, to your notes. And this is telling us that this is the computation of the percentage change in the price of orange juice, which is the change in the log of the price index. This is what we have done. This is the price index, okay? <clears throat> so we uh, just type a regular regress command, DLPOJ, FDD. If you are using the whole data set, you don't have to specify the years or from which month to which month, okay? If you are actually, this, if this is actually your whole data set, you don't have to specify it. Okay, and this is actually in this analysis, the whole data set, but this is just additional information for you. If you actually delete the if command, you will get the same result because our data set already starts from the first month of 1950 up till the last month, which is December of 2000, okay? Adding this R is robust. So this is not the health risk elastic standard error. This is just a robust standard error, as you can see, in the result. What we got here is what we have seen on the slide, which is um, a one unit increase in FDD, or the unit is the day. So a one day increase in FDD increases the percentage uh, of the price by point, about 0.47%. Okay, so the price has, uh, or I mean like uh, the freezing degree days increases the price and has a statistical significant impact at the 10%, sorry, 1%, okay, at the 1%, all right? This number is less than 1%. So um, this is for just having one X. You can see here I have only one X. What if I want to include the previous lags or the previous values of FDD, the previous uh, or the history of freezing degree days? So we can generate the set of freezing degree lags. So this one generate, this is L0, so today, okay? Today is equal to today, FDD. 
you're free to choose it to write it this way or just type it FDD, right? Then L1 stands for leg one FDD is L1 dot. You can type it in capital O or small letter L. Same L2 FDD, L dot, L2 dot, L3, L3 dot, and so on. And remember, everything before the equal sign, you're free to call it whatever name you like. But I find it easier to call it what I expect, which is L0, which is lag zero, which is today. L1 is lag one, right, which is last month. L2 is two months ago, and so on. So let's see if we include, um, okay, let me start something, do something before we add the legs. So if I want to use the heteroscedastic autocorrelation consistent standard error, um, this command in Stata is called NUI instead of regress. And NUI here stands for the, per, the last name of the person who kind of created, right, or who came up with the heteroscedastic autoconsistent standard error. And the command is written by his name. Okay, so NUI here instead of regress that we have here uh, would let Stata understand that we want to use the hack standard error. And as you might expect, the coefficients are not affected. The coefficients are exactly the same. This command is about the standard error. So the standard error are different because the standard error here is based on the hack estimator or NUI heteroscedastic autocorrelation standard error. And the previous one was just heteroscedastic. The other thing that I need to specify is I need to tell Stata how many lags you want to compute serial correlation for. And this brings us back to the one that I was just explaining, which is the truncation parameter. I have to tell Stata how many M I want, okay? So do you want to compute the serial correlation for the last 10 years, or you just want to pick three? And if we base our uh, decision on this condition, which is the rule of thumb, which I always go with. I never go with a Goldilocks method of too many and too few. Um, if I use this, then, um, which is right here, the rule of thumb, which is take 75% of, uh, of the whole sample size, right? And then raise to the power third. I just wanna tell you something. This is, the sample size is 612. Okay, so here again is one of the things that are affected by me when I imported the a PDF file. So this one is 0 0.755, right? Times 612 to the power one third. And you will get around, just rounded up a little bit. So it's gonna be like seven, okay? So this one is telling me, okay, use seven legs, okay? Use seven legs, because if I, if I don't specify, as you can imagine, I have 612 time or data points. I would never go and keep on computing, right? 612 serial correlation over 612 months. It's just too much. So we are using the rule of thumb by saying, okay, compute the serial correlation for the last only seven months, okay, which is uh, uh, less than four years, okay? So, what we have here is expanding the model by adding the legs, okay? So, when I expand the model and Sorry, I did a mistake. Uh, this, is, this is telling me use seven months, okay? Just go all the way. Why, I did, why did I say, why did I say years? Okay, so this is rounded to months because the data frequency is months, okay? So this one is telling me that I'm only concerned about the serial correlation over the last, seven months and that's it. 
Okay, now we're expanding the model by adding the legs. Just remember that everything in the, in the like previously was just stopping up to today, present value of freezing degree days, how it affects the percentage change in the price. Now, I want to also include the lags, okay? So you have two ways. You can learn the command called global. What is global? It's just a shortcut. So global here is telling Stata, create for me a variable called, uh, L stands for the lag. Call it anything. You can call it your name, by the way. So, but I, we always call it something that we do remember. Okay, so L stands for the lag, FDD, freezing degree days, up to six lags. And telling Stata, take for me all the variables that I have already generated, present value of FDD, first lag, second lag, up to six lag, okay, and use it in my analysis. And then when I come to the regression of NUI, DLPOJ, if I just have the dollar sign and the name of the variable that I've just created in a global command, it would understand, Stata would understand that I want all these regressors. Of course, as you can understand that, you can remove this and you just have all these regressors instead. But I prefer to have a global command because it makes our uh, work uh, easier, okay? Especially if I'm, if I'm repeating the same uh, regressors from one regression to the next, one regression to the next. I don't have to keep on typing the same variables again, okay? So it's just for your own, uh, sorry, it, this is just for, to make your life easier, okay? And I always want you to keep learning new commands. So global here is our new command. Okay. Again, based on the rule of thumb, we used seven um, legs. Okay. And this one is telling me how the present value uh, or I mean the freezing degree date today affect the price today statistically significant and important and positive as we said. What about last month? How freezing degree days of last month affect the price of orange today? Again, it would increase the price. However, the effect gets smaller, right? So the magnitude from 0 point about 0.47 is now about 0.14. So the impact gets smaller. Statistically significant, as you can see, but at the 10% only. How about this one? Small magnitude, but I really don't care about it. It's insignificant. How about this one? Insignificant. Don't, don't analyze it. Anything that you see it insignificant, do not go ahead and say it has a certain magnitude or do not analyze the 0.07 or the 0.05. Given it's indifferent from zero or insignificant, you don't have to waste your time. Again, insignificant insignificant right so when i look at the results here i would say that the impact of freezing degree days is significant only up to the first leg anything else is insignificant okay any question any question Robert, you just arrived. Or can you follow? No, I'm, I'm going to be honest. Yes, I'm actually yeah, I'm at work again. I, uh, I'm following back and forth. Yeah, if you have any question, let me know. So if you, I know and understand that you attend from work. So it would be a great idea if you can read the slides before coming so that if you're missing something, you know, uh, or you at least come with questions, you know, so that you're not missing anything, especially with topics like this one. Okay. No, it's, it's fantastic advice and I really appreciate it. I'll, I'll start doing that going forward. Yeah, perfect. Excellent. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, how about Louis Osman Parth? Any questions? No. Okay. Can someone tell me what is the dynamic multiplier? Dynamic multiplier. I hate to ask a question and answer it. Anybody? 
Okay, let me try to remind you. Um, here. Okay, this is exactly what we're doing in our state example, the one that I'm talking about. This one is called the impact, right? Which is the impact today. Okay, let me try to find something else. Just right here. Okay. Again, this one is actually would make it easier for you to answer the question. Because sometimes someone has to answer the question. Okay, so this is exactly what we're doing in the state example, right? We do have the percentage change here. We do have freezing degree day today, the first leg, second leg, and so on. We kept going up to FDD6. The first coefficient is called the impact effect. The second coefficient, which is attached to the first leg, is called the first period dynamic multiplier. The third coefficient, which I don't see it here, but it's the one attached to x t minus two, is called the second period dynamic multiplier. If I want to compute the cumulative dynamic multiplier, you already know the word cumulative, right? When I'm asking you about your cumulative G G GDP, GPA, not GDP, GPA, cumulative GPA, you keep accumulating GPA over the semesters, adding them up. So cumulative is always adding, right? Um, so cumulative dynamic multiplier is simply, you're going to add up this coefficient with this coefficient with this coefficient. Let's say if I'm asking you the two period dynamic, a cumulative dynamic multiplier is you take the first effect, which is the present effect, lag one and lag two. So when I ask you about the two period cumulative dynamic multiplier, you need to have the impact of the lag one and lag two in addition to the present just add them up. And of course, a question would be, how do you know that they are statistically significant? You would be computing the statistical significance based on the, on the standard error of the addition of the three coefficients. Of course, you're not going to be doing that because it's more challenging, uh, but it's something that Stata would do for you. So uh, any question in the slide, Othman, Lewis? Part? No, I, I think I'm okay so far. Okay, so if you're okay so far, then you should be able to answer for me this question. Let me see. The question is about uh, the slide. Okay. <clears throat> Can you tell me what is the impact effect or impact factor? You said the uh, impact factor? Yeah, the impact factor. We have impact factor. We have first period dynamic multiplier. And we have a second period dynamic multiplier. We have a third period dynamic multiplier. And we have a cumulative Okay, so I'm just asking you, what do you think about the impact factor? Which one is the impact factor? Would that be the 0.09? Impact factor 0.09. Where did you get the 0.09? Okay, which, which one? How did you get 0.09? No, I just saw the probability on F on the screen. No. Uh, so how about uh, Osman, can you tell me what is the impact factor here? Osman, are you with us? I hope that you're not doing like my son. I have my two boys. They are Rutgers students, and I see what they are doing, okay? So they do have the lecture open on their phone, iPhone, and they are on Instagram or something else. So I hope that you're not doing the same. 
Osman, where he, are you? I think he was here earlier. He might be just to the bathroom Osman, or something. I don't know. Okay. We'll see. Uh, Parth. Is it the coefficient of FGD, 0.469? Exactly. Perfect. So the impact factor is definitely... Where do you get that from? So it's right here. Okay. The impact factor is the, is the effect of today, which is FDD, right? It's just a notation. Let me go back to the slide I was talking about. So in the slide, we had this one. See? The impact effect or the impact factor is the beta one, is the coefficient attached to the X of today. Can you see that, Lewis? Yeah, I can see it. Okay, so the impact effect or the impact factor, you see it sometimes it's called factor, sometimes it's called effect. It's always the coefficient attached to XT. Now, my second question would be, and just focus here, first period dynamic multiplier is simply the coefficient attached to the first lag. Second period dynamic multiplier is the coefficient attached to the third lag keep going. What's the cumulative multiplier? If I'm asking you about two periods, then it's going to be today plus this plus third. So uh, where is it? Okay. So okay. Louis, can you tell me what is the first period dynamic multiplier? Was it not what he answered earlier, the 4, 0.469? The 0.469 was called the impact factor, which is the coefficient attached to the present. Okay. The first period dynamic multiplier is the coefficient attached to the first lag. The second period dynamic multiplier is the coefficient attached to the second lag. Do you get that? Yeah, so would the third period just be the following one after that as well? The exactly, yes. Yeah. So you can have, for example, a question um, in an exam or a quiz or an assignment where I'm asking you, can you tell me what is the third period dynamic multiplier? You just go to the coefficient attached to the third leg and you tell me, okay, it's 0 0.0722 whatever and uh, whether it's statistically significant or not. Now, you can have a question about what's the cumulative uh, multiplier for three periods, okay? Cumulative multiplier for three periods. Do you know what, how can you compute that? Uh, no, can you show me? Yes, anybody? Any, uh, anyone can try? Three period don't you just, multiplier. Don't you just add up all the three different periods? Coefficient? Exactly. So cumulative is accumulation, is addition, right? So all what you need to do is to accumulate. So if it is a three period cumulative multiplier, I'm going to add this one to this one, to this one, and to the present. So those three, or those four, I should say, are called the three period cumulative multiplier okay again we refer to keep going to the same slide which we have the, all the names or i should say all the <clears throat> terminologies again so impact effect is the coefficient attached to xt first period dynamic multiplier is the coefficient attached to the first lag. Second period dynamic multiplier is the coefficient attached to the third lag. And then we can specify, I can, be, I can ask you, what is the two period cumulative multiplier? So two period cumulative multiplier, you need to add lag one, lag two to the present. Three period cumulative multiplier is lag one, lag two, lag three to the present. Is that clear? Yeah, so you said uh, the first leg, second, and third, and you also have to get the uh, present one, right? Exactly, Four. which is the impact effect. Exactly. Okay. <clears throat> Perfect. Uh, let's so can you just 
Can you repeat that one more time? I'm sorry, I was in the bathroom. Oh, Osman, I was calling you. Oh, really? <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yes. I'm sorry. I just had to step in the bathroom. Okay, which part did you miss? Uh, how you got the dynamic effects. Okay, so um, so we're basically referring to the slide that is. I should I should uh, memorize the number of the slide. Where is it? Uh, it's right here. Slide one nine three. So here. Uh, it's becoming a big mess. You guys are enjoying online learning? No, not at all. Yeah, me too. How about anybody? Anybody li likes online learning? Of course, with econometrics, is definitely the answer is no, I guess. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to lie, Ms. This semester is pretty difficult for myself. Online yeah, learning. I guess most of you are graduating in May. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, do they? Yeah, they're gonna like have classes right now, and they're all online. It's just a lot to keep up with, you know. <clears throat> yeah, are you? Are they gonna hold a graduation uh, on campus I, or? Campus? I I really hope so. I've been looking forward to graduate, like graduating. I've been yeah. at school for like six years now. I'm just you know want to get through with <laughs> and done and over with, you know. <clears throat> yeah, actually, my son is supposed to graduate in May, um, but the but the funny thing is he's enjoying online learning because he's working. <laughs> So he was like, he was all the time thinking about how can he balance between working and he works in Manhattan. So he works in the city and he was like staying on campus in New Brunswick. So he was like, okay, this is the perfect balance ever. He's staying here. I live almost in Manhattan. So he's going to work. He's watching his lectures on his iPhone. Okay. He's taking uh, his tasks or whatever online so he's happy about the, this arrangement yeah it sounds like he's living it good yeah it sounds good for him yes and he really doesn't care about graduation i want to let you know <laughs> i was like um, i care more about his graduation i was like okay you don't really care that you don't have a graduation like, no it's, it's okay for me that's funny but for from me for me like i said uh, as a teacher I used to teach online all the time like since i joined rutgers like since 2012 so i really used to online learning but it's a choice rather than you have to <laughs> you have to teach online so uh, yeah it's a, it's one of the challenging courses to teach online which is econometrics but anyways i hope you guys are following let's go back so osman are you here yeah yeah okay if you're not here i'm not gonna repeat no i'm here for this one <laughs> okay all right so this slide, I want you to uh, make sure that you understand it. So it's just about um, uh, terminologies for the coefficients. So the coefficient that is attached to the present is called impact effect. The coefficient that is, so this one is called the impact effect. This one is called the first period uh, dynamic multiplier, which is the coefficient attached to the first lag. The second period dynamic multiplier is the coefficient attached to the second leg, but it's not here, right? It's like beta three, I can write it, x t minus two, okay? So it's, this is called the second period dynamic multiplier. It's the coefficient attached to the second leg. And you keep going, right? This is the r period dynamic multiplier. Now, we might be interested in cumulative effect, right? So accumulating, adding up all the effects together. So I can be asking you, can you compute the two period cumulative dynamic multiplier? So two period dynamic multiplier, you need to add the coefficient attached to leg one, coefficient attached to leg two, and the present. So the present is always with, with us okay, in our computation, which is the impact effect, the original effect, the main effect. It's always the biggest effect. Okay, so when I go to here, okay, um, can you tell me what is the fifth period dynamic multiplier? Uh, would that be the 0 0.468222? Exactly. So this one is called the fifth period dynamic multiplier, which is the coefficient attached to lag five. 
and then I can ask you, okay, what is the cumulative multiplier for the fifth period? Cumulative multiplier for the fifth period. So, uh, so would that be? Well, I mean, is it? It's not what you just circled. So, is, is it the um, the one point fifty two? No, cumulative uh, multiplier for the five periods. F five period cumulative multiplier. Cumulative is addition. Oh, so the other periods together. Exactly. So you'll keep actually adding everything. Add, 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 well, add, and whenever whatever the number, you will get just one number, and this is going to be called the uh, fifth period cumulative multiplier. Okay. Any question? Osman, I guess you have a, a weak Actually, internet I, connection. I can't hear can you. Can you hear me? No, it's just like uh, your voice keep cutting. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. It's just cause like I have family that's on the Wi-Fi as well for work and school. So I'm outside but right now. That's probably why you hear noise. Okay, perfect. Can you understand? You have any question? No, 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 I'm good. I got it. I'm good. Okay, great. All right. So um, this slide is about, okay, now we know that we have three types of standard errors. We do have the OLS regular standard error if I have a homogeneous model. We do have the heteroscedastic standard error if I have heteroscedastic model and we checked it using the BP test. And we do have the hack standard error, which is the heteroscedastic autocorrelation um, consistent standard error. So we have actually three types. Am I going to use the hack estimator all the time? No, I do have to test that. So I'm going to be always only using it if I do have a serial correlation in the model because it is used in order to correct for serial correlation. Okay, so again, this is one of the things that are uh, ruined using the exporting PDF. So this is X. Hello. Yes. Othman, are you saying something? I can't hear you. My come right back. Yes. Okay, so uh, so here we're going to only use the hack standard error if I do have an autocorrelation or a serial correlation between the XT and UT. Otherwise, we're not going to be using it. Okay, um, let me come back to this when we discuss the, um, the time series topic. Okay, so you can leave that or just write a note that on this slide we're gonna come back to it all right so um okay i'm just going to okay so this is actually i, I showed you that already on uh the example using Stata, okay, how we computed the seven. Uh, so let me move on. These are, you can read the slides. So let's start from here. So this is uh, one of the things that can make your life easy in computing dynamic multipliers or cumulative multipliers. So what we have here is the following, just like doing like a mathematical trick in order to make our life easy in computing uh, cumulative multipliers. So suppose that you have this model, you already understand what is this model about. Now, suppose that you add and subtract beta one x t minus one. No, no, sorry. You add, you add and subtract beta one x t minus one, right? And then you take common factor for beta one here and common factor for x t minus one right here. So you can rewrite this equation by taking common factors one time for beta one and another time for x t minus one. 
what we get is um, beta naught again, beta one again. This is xt minus the previous year is delta, which is the change. As you can see here, I'm writing delta here with my pen because it wasn't, um, it was lost when I imported the PDF file. So beta one, delta xt, and we're gonna get beta one plus beta two. As you can see, this is a cumulative multiplier, right? This is the cumulative multiplier or a first period cumulative multiplier. So you don't have actually to add anything. If I'm, if I'm, uh, if I'm estimating this model like here by saying, um, no way or regress um, price of orange juice on D dot FDD. So D dot means the change, the change, right? And then uh, L1 FDD which is x t minus one, then I would be able to look at the coefficient attached to this one and say this is the cumulative multiplier of period one. So can you say, can you understand that? So this is the POJ, okay? Like I feel like this looks like a two. So this is POJ. So if you go uh, to your uh, regression and let's say you typed it this way. One time I have a D, for the difference, which is the change. And one time I just have the first lag, which is for this one. The coefficients, that's the coefficients that I will get in the output can be interpreted as the impact effect or the impact factor, right? And the first period cumulative multiplier. Okay, so uh, impact effect and the first period cumulative multiplier. However, I prefer to do it like manually and keep adding it up so that it's clear to you. Uh, but this is another way of doing it. So let's see, uh, take, let's talk about this exercise. And you do already have it in your uh, textbook. I, I can't remember which page, but you will find it by the end of the chapter. So, what do we have here is my dependent variable is the same, which is the price of orange, okay? And the independent factor is the freezing degree days. And I have a freezing degree days of zero lag, which is today, last month, two months ago, six months ago, keep going, and this, regression ends at 18 months ago, okay? So as you can see, the main difference between one and two is one, we are estimating the same way I did on the Excel, ex uh, on, the, uh, on the state exam, okay? Which is we're setting up the model using uh, the price of orange and the lags of FDD. The main difference between one and two is in two, it's uh, the regression in terms of cumulative. So it's already created in terms of cumulative, as you can see here, right? It's like this. So this is in column two. Instead of having y on xt and xt minus one, xt minus two, xt minus whatever, 10, we're setting up this regression in terms of the percentage change in price on the change in FDD and the first lag. And this would give me like uh, a shortcut of the cumulative dynamic multipliers without me having to compute it. So, so this is a number two, okay? The main difference is this is dynamic and this is cumulative. Okay, what do we have in three and four? Three and four are, are called sensitivity analysis. So I would, uh, once I get my results in two, I wanna check to what extent my results are robust, to what extent my results are good, to what extent my results are insensitive to some changes in my regression. 
So in number three, what we did is just follow what the author did, not what we, not the author did. So this is the truncation parameter here was uh, we using seven, uh, only seven for the computation of the serial correlation. Again, seven, a sensitivity analysis to doubling the truncation parameter to 14. Does that make any changes in the model? We're gonna see. Now, the fourth, the, 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 the last, I mean, sensitivity, this is a sensitivity analysis one, sensitivity analysis two. The second sensitivity analysis was keeping the same truncation parameter to seven, but including monthly indicators. So I do have dummies included in the model that refers to the months of the year. So I have a dummy for January, dummy for Feb, for March, for April, for May, each dummy. So I do have uh, 11 dummies. Remember I'm saying 11 dummies because I still have the intercept included in the model. So I have 11 dummies um, included and I wanna see, do I really need monthly dummies? Because I understand that which month uh, of the year I'm talking about would affect the number of freezing degree days because December would have the highest as we would expect and August would have the least, right? Um, if I'm talking about the weather in the US. So August is supposed to be on average the hottest month and December on average is the coolest month. So do I need to include monthly dummies and this one is telling me including them and this one is the test so before talking about three and four let's talk first about one and two so in one and two one is just the dynamic multiplier and uh, we were uh, we can analyze it the same way i did analyze uh, the state output right so this one freezing degree day today has a 0.5 percent impact on increasing the price, 0.5 percent impact on increasing the price. Um, last month still has a positive impact on the price. Still positive, but the impact gets smaller and smaller, maybe still constant, smaller, smaller. Thus impact gets all the way smaller, smaller, and even gets to a negative and even a zero as you go back, back, back in the past. However, we also need to, to check whether these are statistically significant or not, right? Because if these are statistically insignificant, then I really don't care about the magnitude. So uh, we don't have here a computation of the t-statistic, but you can do it on your calculator by dividing this number over this number, and you will get the t-statistic and you will be able to say, okay, is the impact effect is statistically significant or not? Is the first period dynamic multiplier is statistically significant or not, and so on. So I haven't done that, but I do have a graph. I have a graph that would make my life easy to tell you whether this is statistically significant or not. So the graph is called the dynamic, it's right here. This is just graphing column one. So this is the graph of column one. And it has the effect that we have, let's say, we start in time zero at 0.5, which is right here from column one. Okay, and then you keep adding up the other points, which keeps on decreasing, as I told you, and one time it was actually zero, and so on, and negative and so on. What we have on the edges are the computation of the confidence interval. And as long as my confidence interval does not include the zero, then the effect is statistically significant. As you can see, the zero is included inside the confidence interval everywhere right here. And actually starting from right after the first period. So what I can say, even if the author does not compute for us, or did not compute for us the t statistic, we can definitely compute it using the calculator. But we can actually look at the graph provided and say the only statistical significant is the impact effect and the first period cumulative, uh, the first period dynamic multiplier. That's it, nothing else. 
everything else insignificant. So I really don't see any impact of 18 months ago on today's uh, price of oranges. Um, these are additional information for us, monthly indicators, we don't have any, uh, using seven lags for the truncation parameter. Uh, cumulative multiplier, again, this is uh, computed right here. Can we say anything about the statistical significance, which is accumulating the effect from one month to the next? And these are the confidence interval, again, up to the 12 months. Before anything before the 12 months is statistically significant. Anything after the 12, I don't know what this line is like, not straight. Anything after the 12, right, is insignificant. So you can get this, uh, just trying to make it straight as much as I can. Um, so anything after the 12 months in terms of a cumulative effect is insignificant because the zero is included in the confidence interval. So I can say it's indifferent from zero. Anything before the 12 months is, so in other words, the cumulative effect of the freezing degree days is statistically significant up to one year. That's it, right? More than a year is insignificant. 12 months is the year. Next. So you can just by looking at the, Second column, you can say up to here. Anything after that is insignificant. In three, what we're doing is, what about doubling the truncation parameter, allowing for 14 lags of uh, correlation instead of seven? Uh, what we can say is by looking at coefficients, really no change in coefficients, right? because the truncation parameter is affecting the standard error, but not the coefficient. So the standard error, I can see the tiny difference, right? 0 0.14, 0 0.13, 0 0.17, 0 0.16, 0 0.19, same 0 0.19, 0 0.20, slight difference. So if this is the case for all the others, 0 0.27, 0 0.28, 0 0.30, 0 0.31, you can easily say that my model is insensitive to doubling the truncation parameter. So my model in two is robust to doubling the truncation parameter. Next, in four, what if someone is telling you that this analysis uh, might have omitted variable bias because you're not including uh, the impact of the months. You're not including a dummy for the months. You're not having any um, effect absorbed that the fact of December is the coolest month and August is the hottest month of the year. So can you add dummies? So yes, here means that the author has included dummies for the month. And based on the results, as you can see, I'm gonna analyze the p-value. There is a 43% probability that the dummies are equal to zero. In other words, actually you don't need monthly dummies. Non monthly dummies are statistically insignificant. So your model, you can answer the question if someone is asking you, do you think you have um, uh, statistical insignificant, uh, do you think you have omitted variable bias coming from the fact of not including monthly dummies? Your answer would be no, because I've done the test. I have included the monthly dummies, and my answer is there is a 43% probability uh, uh, that these monthly dummies are equal to zero. <clears throat> okay, so uh, I'm gonna stop here for the slides. Whatever you see next, which is about the QLR. I prefer to talk about it first in the time series before coming back here. So let me come back to this one after I talk about the time series analysis uh, topic. All right, so what we're gonna do is, we have an, an exercise, which you already have, uh, you have it on Sakai. So let's start with the non-state exercise, okay? I'm gonna leave this for you. I want you to read it and answer it. And I'm gonna come back, okay? So now it's 2.30, I'll give you 15 minutes, okay? 
to finish one and two and be ready because I want to take notes and I'll come back and ask you. Okay, so uh, you have question one, points A and B, same for question two, A and B. Um, you, can, you can skip question three for now. I'll leave question three for you as uh, homework, okay, so that we can discuss it next week. But for now, uh, or maybe today, actually, if we have the time, uh, we, we, we will see how you will proceed with these two questions. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna stop. I'm gonna leave you to do questions one and two, and I'll be back at two. Now it's 2.30, I'll be back at 2.45. Any question before I go? These are non-data questions, okay? So you don't need any data set or anything, just pen and paper. All right, so uh, I'll leave you. I'll be back in uh, 15 minutes. I'll close my camera, I'll close my mic. I'll be back in 15 minutes, 2.45.
All right, everyone. So, um, <clears throat> are you done? Let's start question one. Um, um, part, did you do like the calculation of the long run cumulative dynamic multiplier? No, I'm still working on it. Do you know how to do it? Is it is it 3.5 by any chance for the first one? Or is that not it? No. Mm -hmm. How did you get the 3.5? Oh, I thought you would just like, well, since I saw the word cumulative, I thought you would add the, um, the 0.83, the one there in parentheses. The 0.03, where is the 0.03? Uh, 0.83, 0.83, like the ones that numbers in the parentheses? No, remember, the numbers in the parentheses are standard error. So what you want to add up is the coefficients, which is the impact, not the, not, not the standard error, right? Okay. Uh, so uh, what we have here is, I'm trying to give you some hints. So now this is the... Uh, unemployment rate in, in Canada, right? And it's a function of unemployment rate in the US. So you are Can is Canada you, unemployment rate and you are US unemployment rate in the US. Now, last year or last quarter, because it's a quarterly data set. So last quarter, two quarters ago, three, four, and five quarters ago. And the question is to compute the cumulative dynamic multiplier so what we uh, do you know what's the name of this coefficient which is the effect of today or this quarter do you know what's the the name of this coefficient are you are you asking me you or anyone or part yeah it's just me and part right now yeah, that's what I know. Is it the impact <laughs> effect? Exactly. So it's the impact effect. So 0 0.717 is the impact effect. And then this is the one period dynamic multiplier, period two dynamic multiplier, period three dynamic multiplier, and so on. So, so if I want... To, we yeah. just keep adding those numbers from 0 0.7 to 9? Exactly. Uh, exactly. exactly. So this is exactly what you need to do. To compute the cumulative dynamic is to go from the impact factor of today, you add up these numbers, not their standard error, the numbers itself. And remember, and just notice there is a subtraction here. Mm -hmm. So this plus this plus this minus this minus this plus this, you will get <clears throat> the answer, which is 1.46. This is, this is called a, a long run cumulative dynamic multiplier. Okay, so it's minus 76 plus 1.267. Yeah, you said 1.46, right? Uh-huh. Okay, yeah, I just got that right now, yeah. <coughs> Correct. So this is for number A. Number B. We would ignore that, ignore that first number, the... Uh, it's the coefficient of the intercept. So really, it's not related to unemployment. Yeah. Okay. Right. rate in the US. You just look at anything that has an attached variable. Okay. Okay. And next, this uh, question number B is one of the questions that, uh, in which I don't have a key answer for it because it depends on each student, what do you think? And of course, your, your thoughts have to be related to what we have learned in the, uh, on the slides or on the topic. So, what are some of the omitted variables that could cause autocorrelation in the error term? So we need, in other words, to think about the error term. The error term would include anything or other factors affecting the unemployment rate in Canada. And these other factors that are inside the error term might be correlated over time. Okay, so I need to think about what are other factors affecting unemployment rate in Canada that might be correlated over time and causing the serial correlation problem. This is the first part. And these, once you identify this possible, these possible omitted variables, you want to answer whether these are likely uncorrelated with the current and lagged 
values of the US unemployment rate. So once I figure out what are these factors inside the error term, I want to understand whether I want to find out or I want to think whether they are related to the present and the past values of the US unemployment rate. Because if they are, then we actually have what we call omitted variable bias. And then <clears throat> based on the answer to the second question, we're going to answer the last part. Do you think that unemployment rate in the US is exogenous in this model? So if I see any connection, then they are not exogenous. So I want you to think about uh, this question is like, where is it? Okay, wait. I want you to think about this question as like, um, first of all, what is the error term? What are other factors? And whether these other factors conditioned on you are in the US T and you are in the US T minus one and keep going and you are US T minus five are correlated or not. Okay. And based on that answer, you would be able to answer the very last one. So uh, who can try to answer this question? Lars, Lewis? Can you come up with any factor affecting unemployment rate? Doesn't have to be Canada, any country. The growth rate of the GDP. Say that again. Growth rate GDP? of GDP, economic yes. growth. That's perfect, yes. yes. This is one of the factors, right? So maybe uh, uh, the economic growth in Canada uh, affects unemployment rate definitely. Inflation rate affects unemployment based on the Phillips curve, as you guys know. Um, maybe terms of trade affects unemployment rate. Like unemployment rate is one of the important variables that are actually affected by the state of the economy and whatever state of economy that you are referring to. So okay. as part, yes. Like them are like like high interest rates and like recessions and exactly prices that's and perfect stuff. That'd exactly be cool. so yeah. high interest rates means low levels of investments and low levels yeah. of investments you you are hiring less people hiring less people higher unemployment rate that's perfect so these other factors that either that are included in the error term whether this is economic growth in the U.S. Uh, I'm sorry in the in Canada because the error term is related to Canada which is the dependent variable so. As Parth has said, economic growth, which is GDP growth in Canada is here. Um, as Lois just mentioned, interest rate in Canada is also included here, which would affect the unemployment rate in Canada. Do you think these two factors, which are related to Canada, are connected with the US unemployment rate? Let's take one of them to make our life easier. So Parth has said that Error term includes economic growth of Canada. Is economic growth in Canada is affected by the U.S. unemployment rate? I don't think so, right? I don't see why that would be connected. Or maybe it doesn't that, like me as you know. Like when I talk about connected, I mean actually correlation, and the correlation has this um, from negative one, right? So all the way to one, it could be very, very close to zero, but still correlation. So you might say, yes, I think they, they are not correlated where the correlation is very close to zero, right? Because it's never going to be the case that it's zero because we are not closed economies. Somehow the impact will travel. So you might think, but you have to justify as of why you think it's close to zero or you might think that one of the things actually you can think it's close to zero because these are two big economies, right? So I have Canada and I have the US and the US it's affected mostly by its own variables and the same goes with Canada. I'm not talking about Mexico and the US, 
because definitely the state of the economy in the US would affect the Mexican workers, right? So when I talk about big country versus relatively smaller country, then the effect is huge. When I talk about relatively big countries, then you might make a justification that I don't think that Yes, there is an effect, but I think it's statistically insignificant. You have to use the words that you have or the terminologies that you have learned in class because you say, no, there is no correlation. No, there definitely is a correlation, but you can say it's small correlation, most likely insignificant correlation because the two countries are big. If I can make this assumption, then my answer would be, so the second part are these omitted variables, which is, as you said, maybe interest rate or maybe, as you said, uh, economic uh, growth in Canada are uncorrelated with the current and the lagged values of the U.S. unemployment rate. You can say, yes, they are uncorrelated or the correlation is very, very small, insignificant. Do you think the U.S., if you say yes, then your answer here about exogeneity is yes, exogenous. Right? Once I say it's equal to zero, then yes, exogenous. Connection is zero or almost zero or insignificant, then it's exogenous. And if it is the case, that, then that's the best result that we'd ever, we can like make our assumption on because I cannot assume that I uh, fail to, uh, or I have endogenous model and I'm estimating it using ADL because this model would only work under the assumption of exogenite, okay? So that's why I, I followed the path of trying to find a justification as of why this model might be exogenous. Any questions? Okay, so let's go to question number two. Anyone has tried number two? No, I didn't get that far. Uh, Louis, a parth? No, I didn't try that. Okay, so let's do it together. So uh, in question two, we have actually, which is good because we still have the same example we're talking about, which is the percentage change in the price and how it's affected by freezing degree days today and up to 18 months. And actually the answers to these questions are somehow I answered them already when I was explaining. So uh, one of you would answer this question. So suppose that an agricultural economist tells you that freeze in December is more harmful than freeze in other months. How would you modify the regression to incorporate this effect? And how would you test for this December effect. What do you think you can do? I guess you can increase the effect of on the, just a second. If someone is telling you that December is the most important month, okay? Uh, okay, let me make it easier for you. So in the example we had on the slides, we uh, were testing whether all months, like whether months is Jan, Feb, March, and so on matters. What we did, we had a dummy for each month. This dummy would take one if it is January, zero otherwise, it takes one if it is, um, it takes two if it is uh, Feb and zero otherwise. It takes three if it is March and zero otherwise. So we had a dummy that reflects the months. Now, in this question, I'm asking you for one specific month. So if I want to uh, test the effect of a specific month, what do you think you can do? I guess you can say dummy equals one. Exactly. You will include a dummy. So you would have a dummy variable that takes one anytime I see the month is December. And it takes zero for any other month or otherwise. And this dummy, I'm going to include it here in this regression. So I'm going to have like beta, this is beta 19. So beta 20 D T. 
right? And that's it. This is all what you need to do. So you can actually do something else. You can, uh, which I would prefer, is to also add besides this dummy, you, you add interaction terms. So you would add an interaction term for this one with the D and D interacted here and another here. So it's interacted with all the legs. So I want to know whether December F is like has an, any impact on my percentage change in the price today and the past legs. Or I, I want to make my life simple and just add the dummy. In any case, I can compute the statistical significance. So how would you test the December effect? What do you think? It's easy. If I have a dummy for December and I want to check if it is statistically significant, what do you do? I just run the regression and check for statistical significance. Uh, you what? I can't hear you. Uh, check if it's statistically significant or exactly. not. Exactly. So it's a, which is the t-test or the p-value mm -hmm. of this dummy. And if I have it interacted with each and every regressor I see, how would you test it? So it's more than one coefficient. So if it is by itself with just a dummy, then it's a t-test. If it is interacted with each and every coefficient I see in this regression, how would you test it? What is the test for multiple coefficients? Is it F test? F test, exactly. So if I do interactions and I want to test, then it's multiple coefficients, then I will do F test. If I do just a dummy variable, uh, in this regression, then it's just a t-test, it's one coefficient. Again, as I told you, like this question is one of the questions that I can see different answers from two different students, let's say. So one student would just add a dummy, another student would add a dummy and interaction term, and a third student would just add interaction terms. They are all correct answers, right? Because um, it all by the end would depend on what you actually, because the question is kind of general. It doesn't say, I want to make the intercept difference, different. So if I want to make the intercept different, I would only add a dummy for December. If I want to make the intercept in the partial slopes different, then I'm going to add a dummy for December and interaction terms. If I want to make only the partial slopes different and um, same intercept, uh, yes, and then I'm going to only add interaction terms. As you can see, the setup of the question is very general, so I would expect different answers, just a dummy, dummy and interaction, or interactions only. But the most important thing when it comes to the question of testing, just one coefficient, t-statistic, or p-value, or confidence interval, multiple coefficients, then you do f-test. So All right. Just, uh, a single variable was t, and then multiple variables was the f, so uh, f Statistic. <clears throat> yes, Lois. Do you, uh, what is your question? I'm sorry. No, no, you were just saying earlier that uh, if it was like single. You said it was um. The yes, single coefficient. Like here, for example, single coefficient. I want to test the statistical significance of yeah. the first lag. This divided by this. That's it. So if I have a dummy here, it would be included in a regression. Then all what I need to do is its coefficient divided by its standard error. Check the t-statistic. If it is multiple coefficients, we have a test that we can use for multiple coefficients as we have done multiple times before. And this one is called the F-test, okay? Okay, gotcha. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's, uh, see, let's take the, uh, the last one. Um, okay, so the same economist tells you that damage caused by freezes is not well captured by FDD variable. And she says that a single day temperature with a temperature of 24 degrees is more damaging than eight days with a temperature of 31 degrees. Okay. How would you modify the regression to incorporate this effect? Okay. So here this question is about identifying a certain cutoff Okay. I need to have a certain cutoff in this model 
to tell me when its temperature is below freezing degree days. Um, you can, for example, choose a certain um, cutoff point, let's say 32 degrees, and say 32 degrees is my cutoff for freezing degree days. So I'm going to add uh, a dummy variable, right? And this dummy variable is going to be like FDD dummy. Let me write it as DFDD. And this variable takes one anytime the FDD, right, is freezing, okay? So it's exceeding or equal 32. And it's gonna take zero. No, wait, it's, it's supposed to be the opposite because it's freezing, so it has to be less, equal or less. Okay, less. And it's gonna take a zero if it's FDD strictly greater than 32. So you would include this dummy into this regression, right? And this uh, dummy would be, uh, uh, again, tested the same way, which is by T-statistic or by P-value, right? And you can also interact with the, with the variables in the model. And I want you here to refer to one of the examples about age that I was discussing in the nonlinearity interaction topic when we had age and D age, dummy for age. And I wanted in this example to see if uh, I have a certain threshold of being 39 and older, right? Was it 39 or 29 and older? I can't remember. But anyways, I had a certain threshold, so that's why we have created the dummy. So it's the same idea. If you create a dummy, then you can test it using uh, t-statistic or multiple interactions, then use the f-test. What I want you to do is for next week, take, consider this as your homework, okay? Uh, so when we come to class, you have your answer ready in front of you, and I'm not gonna answer it, so I'm just I'm gonna ask you to uh, answer it, okay? All right, so... Uh, so we just have this and what's uh, do online and piercing in the discussion? Uh, yeah, you have this, this is non-graded, this is for, um, right. yes, for our class discussions. Okay. And you have also homework four, which is the graded one, and okay. you have the discussion for this week. You have so many okay. things to keep you busy. <laughs> but, cool. so, we have, uh, we had uh, Othman who left, we had Robert who left, so next week, let's take A and B, A is going to be answered by uh, Othman and B is going to be answered by Robert, okay? So that then when they hear the recording, they would understand that. So they would have to study, okay? Yeah. Part and Lewis, we're going to talk about C together, all right? So we'll see. Uh, I mean, next week, we're going to talk about it next week. Okay. All right, so what we have left is, so we have 10 minutes about 11 minutes left. What I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the state part. So I'm going to share with you my uh, desktop. Okay. You have already the data uh, on Sakai, and I did send you an email with the data just in case you cannot uh, open it. So uh, I'm not going to ask you to to do the data today because we don't have time. Um, but if you have data open in front of you and you have the data, you can just keep working with me or maybe replicating the do file that you see. So what we have here is a model. Uh, actually, I have it right here. I think I have it somewhere. It's this one? Yes, it's this question. So you have the question on uh, Sakai. So this model is about Australian exports, okay? And we want to see how the increase in US income affects Australian exports. So Australian exports is our Y, is our dependent variable. And the US GDP, which, which is like a proxy for income, uh, is our independent variable. 
So you are actually asked to go to the World Bank Development Indicators website, which is the World Bank database. These data for the how to get it okay because it's important because uh, uh, it might be the case that I would ask you to uh, uh, collect it yourself so the first question is about do you think it's safe to assume that US GDP can be treated as exogenous regressor in this model I want you to think about this point the same way we were thinking about the uh, unemployment rate in Canada and what are, the, what are other factors affecting unemployment rate in Canada, right? And then if these other factors are co correlated with the axis in the model, which is uh, in our exa previous example was the unemployment rate in the US. So here I want you to do the, to follow the same methodology. First of all, you need to think about other factors affecting Austrian exports. This is number one. Number two, you need to think about whether these other factors are important to the US GDP. Important in the sense of correlation. Are, are these correlated or not? If your answer is not, then your answer here, they are exogenous, which is good, okay? Um, I wrote for you a couple of things to Thoughts. Okay, so for point A, um, well, okay, let me first talk about that. So here I imported the data set. In order to work with any time series data set, which is a variable moving over time, you have to declare the data set to be time series. So here I have TS set year means that this is a time series data set with the year variable or the, the period variable is called year. And here I'm summarizing exports and GDP, and, and GDP is the US GDP, exp is the Australian exports. And I actually don't need this step. I, don't, I was creating something extra here. And um, okay, in point A, I was uh, saying that there are arguments for and against uh, treating US GDP as exogenous regressor in this model. Okay, so you can read these two points. Since Australian exports are a factor driving economic activity, they influence Australian imports from the US and consequently US GDP is also affected. So if you go with the first sentence, your answer would be not exogenous or endogenous because the US GDP is affected by other factors, which is in this case imports. However, if it is uh, possible to claim that Australian imports from the US are very small compared to total US exports, and in this case, it's safe to treat US GDP as exogenous, right? So this, this is just one justification that you can make in order to um, assume that you have exogeneity conditions satisfied so you can move on with estimating the model. Next, uh, in the question, I'm asking you in point B, use the new west standard error which is the heteroscedastic autocorrelation standard error estimate the dynamic make sure the indication parameter m so i did actually extra steps here just for uh, your own learning so what i did here um, of course you have to create the lags l0 is gdp lag zero which is today lag one, lag two, lag three, all the way to sixth lag as the question is asking you. Here, this is my extra step, okay? So in this extra step, I just, I didn't do the new rest, just I'm doing regular OLS. So here I just have a regular model in which I have regular OLS, GDP is highly statistically significantly affecting US exports, right? R here stands for just a robust standard error. It's not the uh, autocorrelation uh, one. Now, starting from here, I'm using the Noe West standard error, 
right? Uh, I mean, like new rest, uh, uh, new rest test air standard error, which is the hack estimator, which is the heteroscedastic autocorrelation consistent standard error, and using a truncation parameter of seven. Again, you can actually remove this part. You don't have to keep it if you're using the whole sample, okay? Because actually my whole sample goes from 1960 to 2009. I have it for you here in case one day you want to estimate a model like half the sample from 1960 to 1980 or so. Right, um, and then we have a lag here. Okay, so this one is, okay, this is, as you can see, the Nui West standard error uh, is estimated, still statistically significant. The standard error is taking care of the possible uh, autocorrelation. Notice that the difference between this and this, they are exactly the same, coefficients are the same. So as long as I'm using robust or no way, I'm just changing the standard error. I really not, I'm not changing anything in the coefficients. So they are exactly the same. The T statistic, the P values and confidence interval are all affected because the standard error has changed. Okay. Um, what else? Here I did one uh, thing, which is, uh, okay, we've, we're done with B. Number C, we did a sensitivity analysis by doubling up this truncation parameter. So if the truncation parameter is seven, I tried it with 14, okay? And with the 14, oh, I'm sorry. I forgot to add the lags. So we still have to add the lags and then try one time with seven and one time with 14. Okay, so these are the lags, adding the lags. Uh, what we can say is, look at the standard errors. This is with seven and this is with 14. They are very close, right? So I don't see a big difference, huge difference between this and this. So there is no measure of what is a big difference. So you just look by your, by your eyes. Like for example, I'm not seeing that this is point 0116596 and this one point 0.011158 whatever i'm not saying like i'm not saying this is 2 and this is point 0.01 right or this is 3 and this is point 0.01 they are moving around the same numbers so you can conclude that your model is insensitive to doubling the truncation parameter from 7 to uh, 14 okay uh, what else um, yes just remember this is your impact effect, first year dynamics, second year dynamics, third year dynamic, and so on, okay? Uh, it's interesting to see that the impact of effect is insignificant, right? Even the first lag, second lag, it started only to be significant starting from the fifth lag, right? Fifth and sixth, that's it. These are the only two statistically significant uh, lags in this model. All right, so I think uh, it's uh, kind of a straightforward uh, as long as you understand that all what you need to change is the NUI instead of RAG and create the lags. Again, you don't have to, to have this part at all if you are using the full data set, which is our case. Okay, and then um, doubling up the truncation parameter. At many times it affects your results, but we are lucky in this model, it does not, right? The, the standard errors are almost within the same uh, range. Okay. Any question?